thinking. All right, we're live. We're short a co-host today. John is absent doing some important family business. So today it's going to be myself and Caitlin showing up for the Deep Health Academy. And we have our special guest, Heather Lynn Darby, who is the founder of Balanced Health Styles. She has co-founder Michelle Jerome as well, but she's not here with us today. Perhaps we'll see her in another episode. Um, but we've invited her on today because this is the launch of our next endeavor, which is the Deep Health Academy. And I thought Heather would be a fantastic person to come on and talk with us about deep health and why it matters so much in the, the health and wellness landscape of today, because she is also a precision nutrition level two certified coach. They used to call us super coaches. I don't know if we're still super coaches, but <laughs> that was the title they gave us right? Uh, originally. So um, we've invited her on today just to have a really great discussion about deep health and, and how that applies to what it is we're going to be talking about in a few weeks coming up and some about her project, Balanced Health Styles. So welcome, Heather. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about uh, why you feel deep health is such an important topic in the health and fitness world today. Yeah, I've been getting a little annoyed over the last couple of years that it's there's a lot of conversation about as the aesthetic value of healthy behaviors. And it's kind of led to the conclusion that the only reason why you would eat well or work out is to change the way that you look. Hmm. And that's so far down the list of important reasons that I just got a little bit annoyed and then it got worse because since that's the only conversation that's really happening, people think that's the only reason that you would do it. And so that's the only thing that they're seeking. Therefore, it's a self-referential cycle where coaches and personal trainers, that's the only thing they can sell is weight loss and getting abs or, you or know, a big butt. I mean, like yeah. that's the or right the, now it's all about you know, forget abs, right? Those we don't need those aesthetic values. <laughs> and so coaches are like, well, that's the only thing I can sell because that's the only thing that people will buy. And the, I'm like, well, that's the only thing they're buying because that's the only thing you're selling. Right. You can really it is open it up and start talking about some of the other benefits. In when we're talking about deep health, we're talking about existential health you know, about your environment, about your social environment with your friends and family and how that affects your behaviors, then we can start to really crack that nut about what's holding people back. And then if your body shape changes, it's just a natural side effect. Yeah. And I think that's actually a completely different narrative than what's been presented in the past. And like you say, it's a self-perpetuating cycle and you can see this play out with social media. I think when social media marketing became so much more popular in the last seven to 10 years, you really saw a huge focus on aesthetic fitness and having coached for a really long time, I'm sure all of us here will agree that 90% of our people who show up really, when you ask them deeply why they're there, it's not for abs right? They, they want to play with their kids or they want to be able to take care of their aging parents or they just have had a really rough time and they want to feel better in their body or whatever. But the weight loss is always a side effect of the other goals, not the other way around. And I think it's a real shame that we haven't been talking about it this way because it is exclusive rather than inclusive, you know? And there's a lot of things yeah. that people can maybe start as they age, start to get some really scary diagnosis from their doctors you're pre-diabetic or actually diabetic, your cholesterol is, you know, doing this or that, or you're having some other lifestyle induced and lifestyle reversible issues. And if no one's really talking about that, of how you don't have to necessarily be on medication, what an impact that can make on people's lives, especially in the United States, where some of these medications are really out of the financial reach of plenty of people. And it's it's ironic and tragic that those are the people that feel like they're underrepresented in fitness and health imagery. Mm -hmm. Like they, they don't feel like that's, the gym is not for me, that's for slender, ripped, you know, whatever people, or 
That's where you go to lose weight. That's not where you go to take care of your cholesterol. Mm, and there's a really big disconnect between that. It's like, you know, you feel like you have a health problem, you go to the doctor, but the doctor's solution is always medication, right? Mm -hmm. And we've talked about this on previous live streams about how the current medical system is set up not as preventive care, right? right? But it's it's a medication system. And so when we, we look at like people who want to improve their health, it's always a lifestyle factor, right? Caitlin, you were just talking about this before we went live about your personal journey. So Maybe you'd like to share a little bit about how you got into this and why. Well, so I actually did bodybuilding um, along my journey to gut health. And I realized that, that makes it worse. <laughs> so, so it doesn't matter what you look like aesthetically or even what you can accomplish physically. Because I've, I've also been in sports and done track and cross country and was very successful. Um especially in track, but I still had these underlying health problems that nobody took me seriously on because I looked like a healthy young woman. So there, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with you when meanwhile, you know, we have these, these issues that start when we're young, uh, probably for most people more specifically, maybe in their late twenties, early thirties, where like the root of disease is taking root at that time and if we're not addressing it then then we're getting the diagnosis later on and it's that's what we need to get people to understand is like you, everybody's waiting they're waiting for the diagnosis that's the problem mm, that's a really good point i hadn't quite put it together that way but i think this is where deep health comes back in right like if we're focused on living a healthy lifestyle and and i work with pro athletes as well as you know average clients that come to me but this perception that's out there that being an athlete, being at the the edge of performance is healthy, yeah. I think is another piece of the deep health narrative that needs to sh some light shined upon it because that's not what being an athlete is. It's not about promoting your health. It's about performance. Well, look and at so the last can... two years with COVID. I, I don't know how many people you guys had come to you, but I had several people tell me that someone who was a marathon runner who was healthy died. Yeah. From COVID. And I was like, well, let's ask, what is healthy? Yes. Well, they ate salad and they ran marathons. Like I. <laughs> well, I can tell you from experience that athletes don't have any better eating habits than regular people. Oh. <laughs> you know, and that's not, I don't feel like that's a shameful secret. I think it's just human. And I think that's why deep health is critical, right? Because we're all human beings and we all have stressors in our lives and we have relationships that need attention and, and our food choices are always a byproduct of those things. It's, I, I literally tell my clients in the intake, it's like, I promise you, it's not the food. It's never mm -hmm. about the food. I'll write you a meal plan today and you can take it away and I'll prove this to you in three weeks when you don't follow it. You don't need a meal plan. You know, you need to figure out how to change your environment so that it supports your behaviors and, and not just get told what to do. So, hmm. Oh, definitely. Getting told what to do doesn't work. Like, who likes that? <laughs> no, no, well, everybody thinks they like it, right? They think I just need somebody to solve this problem for me. But then well, not think, back to, think back to when you were a kid or worse, a teenager, right? Mm -hmm. Your parents telling you what to do. That's the opposite of what you're going to end up doing. Absolutely. Yeah. That's just human nature. You don't outgrow that as an adult. When someone tells you, you know, you have to do this, you have to be a certain way, you have to take these tests, you have to whatever. And you're like, I don't want to. Even something as simple as like, you have to show up to work at a certain time and you can't leave at a certain time and you have to take your lunch between these. You're always finding ways to push those boundaries because you're like, no one's going to tell me what to do. Absolutely. Why would you think that your health behaviors would be any different if someone tells you you have to work out this way, eat this at this time, you're going to find an excuse why that doesn't work for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, I think this is part of the, the deep health model is, is not come, not showing up as the expert or the guru, right. Mm -hmm. And saying like, this is the way <laughs> not to put the Mandalorian or anything, but like, <laughs> you know, not doing that because that actually, it, although it feels comforting at first to people when they feel lost or out of control or like they want big change, that's the thing they think is going to help them. So they show up like, yes, please, please help me tell me the things. But that's not actually what they need. And I think that's part of finding the right kind of coach 
because if you if you follow the fitness marketing model that exists today, it's going to be a very much like, here's this photo of me. I look this way because I eat these things and I do this exercise. You can just do that same thing too. And then when you show up and find out that that's not going to work for you, these coaches aren't doing other things to support that. And so finding coaches who are trained more in behavior change psychology or who are trained in understanding really the physiology behind nutrition or the physiology behind training protocols and helping you figure that out for your specific body, right, I think is is one of the key factors in finding a coach who's genuinely going to help you change your lifestyle. And I would go a step further, not just for your specific body, but for your specific lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. For your specific schedule to fit in with all the other demands of your everyday life. Yeah. It's, it's a tricky thing, right? Because it's, it's so much less comfortable to show up and say, too. like, like if, even if they did decide to take the plan that you give them and execute it perfectly and lose all the weight, did they learn anything from what you gave them? Like, did they understand like, well, from, from what I do, like why we cut out the seed oils or why we cut out the processed sugar and what kind of effect that has on the body, or did they just ignore all that information, take the meal plan, follow it. And then when they're done, they're like, Oh, look. Oh yeah. I call that white knuckling. (laughs) Yeah. I like that. (laughs) You're just like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to grit through, I'm going to make it. And then at the end, what happens? You let go because you made it to your goal. And then what are you going to do? Mm. I call it the pendulum swing, actually, because it's you put so much energy into this thing, right? And you're pushing and you're pushing and you're pushing and you're just you're driving this pendulum up a hill, basically, right? But at some point, that's going to overwhelm you and that backswing is going to be vicious. And so if you can avoid actually like creating a massive swing in your behaviors, you're going to find that it's so much more sustainable, right? You can, you could have a little swing, right? That's fine. That's natural. A little bit of movement here and there. Sometimes you do a little bit more of one thing and a little bit less of another, but the harder you're trying to force behaviors over to one side or the other, the the bigger the backswing, right? So I'm going to share my screen really quick here because I did a presentation recently um, for a company on deep health. And this is one of my first attempts at trying to like harness this wily, out of control, large beast into some slides. <laughs> so I'm going to pop a couple of these up here and just like, I think it might be fun to, to spend a few minutes just talking about some of these a little more in depth and getting your perspectives on, on them. I mean, I know what I said when I did the presentation, but I'd love to hear what you ladies have to say about it. Um, so let's see. My first time sharing screen. So let's make sure I share the right one. Hey, did that work? Hey, look at that. Okay. So this is a this is a slide I put together when I, I talked about breaking down the components of deep health. Um, there's a Venn diagram I did on deep health too. We can go back to that if we want to. But I think it's really important to understand that there are so many aspects of this that might need some kind of tweaking to help you make improvements in other areas. Like most people come in the physical route, right? Like my knee hurts. I need somebody to help me fix my knee or my blood pressure is high, or um, I need to be able to run 5k or whatever, whatever the, the thing is, most of the paths to entry into health and fitness revolve around the physical aspect of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that a lot. I mean, so initially I struggled around 12 with depression really, really, really bad. Physical, when I started running, is actually, um, that's how I started feeling better. Well, And then, so I, I kind of just thought that was the answer. And uh, I do think most people come into the physical and, and then once they see some improvement, it's just hard to try to figure out for most people because the information isn't, isn't really out there. Like, where do I go from here? Like, what what is actually going on um depending on their other health issues so like knee problems like you go and you get physical help with that but is there inflammation going on like do they even know that that could also be a part of the knee issue 
No bias? So you mean looking at it from a more whole person perspective rather than like targeting one area. Right. And we, we talked about this a little bit on the, the live stream that we did about the medical system, right? Where we've moved away from a generalist model into mm -hmm. a specialist model where pretty much you, you target or you spot treat specific parts of your body. Like you can talk about it from the point of view of um, heart doctors, cardiologists talking about high blood pressure um, or blockage of the arteries. We're looking at that specifically. And the solution is take this pill. If you have clogged arteries or high blood pressure, the solution is not, well, why, why right. do you have high blood pressure? What's going on in your life? Are you super stressed out? That could be driving your blood pressure up. Is it, is it emotional? Is it physical? Is it something in your environment? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, do you live at altitude? Yeah. Yeah, I was looking at this and I don't know, I don't see stress called out specifically, but I feel like it's in the social relational probably. Mm -hmm. And that was my kind of backstory is I came from a corporate environment where it was a tremendous amount of stress. And then I got laid off. So I was like verging on burnout. Then I got laid off. And so basically my whole life collapsed and I moved to the physical movement and training and trying to take control of like nutrition and things like that. I'm like, well, that's the only thing in my life I can control. Um, and I feel like that if people are, it got to a point where there's a, I called it exercise bulimia. I think that might be a thing now, but it wasn't mm -hmm. at that time. And I was like losing weight at a precipitous rate, a dangerous rate. And it was, be it was not because of how I wanted my body to change. It was because I needed to have control of my stress. Mm -hmm. So when you're just thinking, oh, it's just about exercise and nutrition, mm -hmm. those are just tools. Those are just behaviors. The problem might not be the exercise and nutrition. It might be other things. It might be the family relationships. It might be your job environment. It might be, you know, systemic racism is a problem in your life and it's preventing you from being a fulfilled, fulfilled in your life. Yeah. Um, it might be a toxic environment. Like there might be pollutants in your water or something like that. Like nutrition choices aren't going to change or help those problems. So just saying that, you know, someone's behaviors makes them healthy or not healthy, or the way that someone looks makes them healthy or not healthy. It's not just that cut and dried. Yeah. And I think for a long time, the model has been held up as that cut and dry calories in calories out, right? You just yes. need to move more and eat less and that'll solve all of your problems. But the reality is if, if you live in a food desert <laughs> and you don't have access to healthy food um, or you don't have the free time because you live in extreme poverty and basically all of your time is devoted to your survival and maintaining a stable home, then, you know, move more, eat less is a ridiculous thing to apply. It's impossible and it's demotivating. And just the idea that your whole point in life is to be smaller, move more, eat less so that you can lose weight so you can be smaller. Like, when did that become like the standard <laughs> that the only valuable thing to do is be less? It just doesn't make any sense. And I would mm -hmm. just like to break that apart. Oh, for sure. I think we get to do a whole episode on how your physical appearance should not be the only thing of value that you have. You know, and right. we can talk smaller, better. Right. Number on the scale. Yeah. I mean, I can, to be 120. <laughs> I can speak personally about the fact that like my body functions so much better at a higher body weight than what I've always strived to achieve. And I, it's taken me many, many years to work through that in a way where I can be happy and fulfilled without being 120 pounds, because that's yeah. ridiculous, right? Already just, I, I, one of my clients, actually my co-host on the podcast is five foot 11. And we did a whole episode on Noom at one point because Noom came out as this super compassionate um, whole health model for dieting that was supposed to be this game changer, right? And so we thought, okay, cool, let's check it out. We went in with an open mind. We thought maybe this is going to be great. And although they've added in some components that I think are, are, moving in the right direction at the end of the day, I'm five foot four yeah. 
and 43 yeah. years old. She's 33 years old and five foot 11. We have totally different lifestyles. It gave both of us 1200 calories. What? Wow. And so it was like one of these things where it was like, okay, so you can see some things are shifting, right? You can get a feel for the fact that people are starting to talk about self-compassion. They're starting to talk about why it's important to take care of yourself so that you have to give to others and why it's important to look at these other components of your life. But then at the end of the day, the algorithm hasn't changed. <laughs> the algorithm still says calories in, calories out, right? Yeah. Which is ignoring the forest for the trees. <laughs> so, I mean, I think... When we look at, we dive into each one of these individually, I think, but at the same time, this is the personal journey you need to go on when you seek out coaching. I think it's like, you know, if you're, if you're watching this and you're, you're looking at these things here and thinking, boy, I hadn't considered this before, or I didn't really understand why having a sense of purpose or a sense of meaning to my actions in the day impacted my food choices. Like, mm -hmm. think about what happened to you during quarantine when all of a sudden you stopped going out and going through your daily motions. Like, all of a sudden, all of this stuff was shaken up. What happened at that point, right? What happened to your food behaviors at that point? There's a million memes about it, <laughs> right? So, you know, it, it's a good opportunity to kind of pause and reflect a little bit on how you've been approaching your health and fitness in the past versus how you'd like to approach it now. And, and if you're seeking help, or if you'd like to work with a coach, how do you go about finding a coach who knows how to help you in this way, rather than just to write you an exercise program or a meal plan? Right. So how does somebody go about finding someone like you, Heather? <laughs> so that's where Michelle and I were like, what is happening? It seemed like that in the industry, um, all health coaches and personal trainers were automatically siloed against their competition who are in truth our peers and i was like why can't we have collaborations why can't we be each other's like secret advantage to know so many other people with their areas of specialization and their background and experience? Why do I have to be like in strict competition with everyone else who I went through precision nutrition with or every other personal trainer that has the certifications that I have? Um, and it makes it hard on the public too. What are they supposed to go through the whole universe of social media to try to find these posts and try to suss out like who's qualified? Do they supposed to go to every person's website as good or as janky as it may be? And that's representative of how they are as a coach. If mm -hmm. we were just like, there's a huge gap here. Coaches and personal trainers go through their education and then they know how to deliver the coaching or the training, but the marketing part in the middle is a huge blank spot. Mm -hmm. And everyone's trying to struggle and business coaches have been, I, I don't want to rip on anyone personally, but I have felt like it's a very predatory space yes. that I'm being pounced upon by business coach after business coach of, you know, make six figures, do this, be on social media, do a podcast, um, do reels, do this, do that, be on uh, marketing calls, just it was all so much. That's its own whole job. Marketing, <laughs> marketers is a profession. Yeah. Like, and we expect, a, and then they're like, oh, well, hire a VA to do all this other stuff for you. And you're like, I'm an independent person. So now not only am I having to be a marketer, but I'm also a manager of a staff. Okay, that's going to work. Anyways, we were like, this is cuckoo. Why don't we collaborate together and create like a coherent message with this deep health messaging within like the scope of our own practices. So there would be like one place, a directory, well, an element of balanced health styles is a directory of collaborating coaches. And these coaches are putting out healthy recipes and articles in their subject of expertise through the lens of deep health so that people can come there and read articles and find out who do they resonate with and, and realize, oh, this person's article who I like or this person's recipe who I like, I can hire them to help me. 
and there's like one place that they can go and be like, I can browse a wide variety of different kinds of coaches who may be in my area or who are in my age range or who address the kinds of goals I have or, or problems that I'm experiencing. And, and that's how we started with Balanced Health Styles. And I actually started it myself because I was experiencing that marketing problem. I am not that great at promoting myself. I'm a pretty modest, humble, and sometimes even shy person. And <laughs> saying, hey, I'm great. I'm better than everyone else. It just didn't land for me. And I was like, all right, well, if I can gather a group of well-qualified and well-loved coaches in one place and shine the spotlight on them, and then I will just stand next to them. <laughs> I <laughs> and love this. I will also get some people who, you know, my specialization is people who are um, experiencing the cycle of chronic stress who sit at their computer desk all day. What does nutrition and fitness have to do with that? A lot. You'd be surprised, Right. And, and how it can impact your focus and clarity and productivity at work. People Absolutely. People really think about that. No, and actually companies are starting to think about this more. So it's a really, because they're realizing that the health of their staff is impacting all sorts of metrics for them. You know, yeah, it's impacting how many absolutely. sick days people take. It's impacting productivity, longevity of employment. All these things are costly for um, companies to have to deal with. And so I think there's, I hope that there is a mindset shift happening around how we behave in our society. And one of my, you know, <laughs> one of my favorite topics is cultural anthropology and how it applies to all of this. And when we look at the systems within which we function, right, we, we have to at some point assess how those systems are working for us. And the reality is, is we have control. Like we can change those systems if they're not working for us. And I think it's been an amazing time in history to watch how all of these things have been turned on their head and, and lots of systems have ground to a halt and people are really coming out and questioning, hey, is this really working for me? Which I think is one of the greatest places to start with deep health is like, is this really working for me? What am I doing? Is, is the South Beach diet really working for me? I've been trying to stick to it for three years and I'm still not able to do it for longer than two weeks. Or, you know, gosh, I've been doing CrossFit and I, I'm a CrossFit certified instructor. So <laughs> nobody throws stones at me, but like, you know, I, do I really, really feel like CrossFit is taking me towards my health and fitness goals? If it is, fantastic. But be persistent about asking that question. How is this working for me? Is this where I want to be going? One of the most powerful and useful questions that anyone can ask is, is what I'm doing moving me towards where I want to be? And sometimes you have to even be like the thing before the thing. Yeah. Where, where do I want to end up? Am I wow. even going in that direction? Mm -hmm. Some people haven't even thought of that. And they're like, all I know is I'm in pain or I'm struggling right now. They don't even know what that wouldn't be like. Yeah, I did actually a part of this as well. I'm going to see if I can't pull this slide up really quickly is talking about um, how your your body responds under stress, right? <laughs> <laughs> And, and the reality is, is when you're in a place of responding out of stress, out of like, I'm in pain, something is wrong, you you have a, an amygdala response, right? Like your logical, rational brain is not in control of that. And so what happens in that situation is I want a solution now. And the entire fitness marketing world is dedicated to solving your problem now. It's not dedicated to helping you figure out how long term to avoid it. Right. And this goes back to the, the predatory marketing systems that are being targeted towards coaches as well. The coaching problem is exactly as you described it. Right. Like I'm not a, I was just saying before we went live that like I fundamentally try to avoid interacting on social media when I can because I'm, I'm kind of shy. And although I talk a lot, potentially, it doesn't mean that I'm super comfortable out in the public space. I don't want to spend my time there. I want to spend my time with my clients. Right. So like, how do I achieve that? And yet have this massive social media presence that's going to keep my business afloat. And there's a whole bunch of people who come along and say, these are all the things you have to do, but they don't line up with deep health. They line up with this amygdala response of somebody's in pain, solve the pain now. In 90 days. In 90 oh <laughs> or God, 12 right. weeks. I mean, <laughs> give me 12 weeks, right? That's perfect. Um, you know, and I think this is a really important space to keep turning our voices up, you know, because th there does need to be a database or something where you can go and find a trusted professional 
And I think this is, it comes back to, it's funny. We were, we were not in the same groups this week in our, our coaching um, course that we're in Heather and I, and I'd be interested to hear a little bit about what you heard as some of the fitness professionals that we are working with at the moment, what their solutions to their, their packages that they're offering are. Cause it used to be, you bought 12 sessions, you were held to a contract, right? Whether you showed up or not, I was going to find a way to charge you for those 12 sessions or 24 or 36 or whatever. Um, and things have changed very significantly because there were some very fundamental issues with that model. So what did you hear in your groups around how people are positioning themselves differently now to, to be found? I, I felt the same way. When I went through PN2 a couple of years ago, a lot of the models of um, how people sold coaching and personal training was by the hour, by the individual session. Um, and that just left people open. It, it wasn't helpful to the client because they could like take it or leave it. They had no idea really how long it would take them to achieve goals. And it also left the coach vulnerable to financial, you know, um, instability. Because if someone was going on vacation, of course, they're going to cancel their session that week or that month or whatever the case may be. Um, now it's moved more toward packages. And last week, I heard a lot of people talking about, you know, 12 week, 90 day, kind of like a quarter's worth of packages. And I was like, is that really long enough for someone to even start to see the results toward their goals? Are you letting them go? Are you letting them think they're going to achieve that by that time? Or are you letting them go just as things are starting to kick in? So well, in these fit pro business groups, um, like I've heard that they're like, well, if it's any longer than 90 days, people aren't going to commit because it's too long. And especially what I do in gut health, it, it, depending on where the person is at that I start with, most people, if they're like the average American, it is going to take much longer than 90 days to get them where they want to go, especially if we have to conquer the like going from the sad diet to learning, you know, what's leading them towards disease. It, it is going to take more than 90 days, more than 12 weeks. I think I, I've put this slide up because I think this sort of encompasses what we're talking about because what <laughs> yeah. is being sold is the top picture, uh -huh. right? I can, I could get from there to that little flag in 90 days. No problem. That's a straight line. It's a flat piece of ground. Psh, nah definitely done. But I think the reality is, is that we're, we're positioning and positioning ourselves as coaches in this, in this area, as, as if we're going to solve this problem for them. We're back to the, the guru mo model of like, show up, I'll tell you what to do and you can, and I'll fix it for you. When in reality, what we need to be saying is like, Hey, this is going to take a little bit of time. Like if you've been struggling with your health and your fitness for many years, it's, it's not going to unravel itself in three months or 12 weeks or six months or whatever. Like this is a long haul journey and we might spend a long time in that little pond right there on that boat. We could be paddling around in there for a bit, right? Like I think getting people to understand that changing their lifestyles and their, their actual everyday actions is a long-term process. You know, somebody asked me a week or two ago, I was actually, it was at a wedding. I was at uh, my co-host's wedding. And one of the husbands of a client of mine looked at me. He said, once your clients sign up with you, they're with you for a long time, aren't they? And I thought that's a very astute observation. And the reality is, you know, on average, people can spend two to three years working with me on, on different aspects of their health and fitness. I'm not saying they don't get results. I'm saying that there is such a large amount of things to unravel and unpick and to, to restructure that it takes a couple of years. If you listen to John's personal story about how he lost a hundred pounds, he'll tell you it took six years to lose that hundred pounds and keep it off. And I think this is what we need to start really talking about more is that this is not a quick fix. This is not something you can show up to coaching and, and expect the coach to just magically fix it for you. Right. It's, it's got to be, it's got to be the process based practice. And I, I don't know how you price your personal coaching stuff, but mine is definitely more of a, a monthly commitment and it goes for a minimum of a year. 
<laughs> and I, I found that nine times out of 10, that's just the beginning of the person's coaching journey. I allow them to opt out at any time. If it isn't for you and it's not something that's working or you can't focus on it the way you'd like to right now, cool. You can totally stop and come back when you're ready. You can never come back. It's entirely up to you. But I think we need to move away from this model of 12 sessions. You're going to commit 100% to this for the next, you know, three, six, nine, 12 weeks. And then everything's going to be awesome from there. Yeah, definitely. When I set... I've gone through many iterations in my growth with the industry and moving from being a part-time to more of my full-time profession. I've changed the way that I approach pricing and packaging, not just for my financial security, but also for what it means, the investment that my client is putting on themselves and their progress, right? If, if someone is not putting in enough money, which is value to them, they're not going to get as much out of it. They're like, man, if I put down however much larger amount of money, then I'm going to get my money's worth. I'm going to really do the thing that they're saying, because if I don't, I've wasted that money. Right. Mm -hmm. But if it's a small amount, the people walk away from how much they spend on the gym membership <laughs> every day forever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've had clients do that, especially when I started and it was like, you know, like, oh, mostly like you want a testimonial and you're like, maybe have like a low amount at that point. Uh, I would give them the plan and everything and they would do nothing. Nothing. Yeah, it's not information that they need, right? It's not the information. It's the community and the accountability and the structure and the guidance. It's not, it's. It's not that I actually have a right. client who has this idea and I hope she doesn't kill me for saying it live, <laughs> but she's like, I want a gym where I pay like a thousand dollars to the gym. And every time I show up, they pay me back for showing up. And I'm like, this is such a genius idea, right? That's but it doesn't, it doesn't model. work. <laughs> it doesn't work as a business model for somebody to stay in business, right? Because <laughs> how on earth would you keep your doors open if you did that with every client? But if you, if you were able to earn back a percentage of your membership every month, you know, you're now changing the tone of what health and fitness looks like. You're changing the tone of what it means to show up regularly and like do something rather than show up and absolutely have to do every muscle in your booty four times, you know, because <laughs> there's definitely, you know, I've been in this industry a long time now and there definitely have been waves where you can see what the trends are. You know, you get people coming and being like, I want a bigger butt. And then you get people coming in saying, you know, I want thick thighs. And then there was the period of time where it was all about abs too, you know, or the, oh gosh, God forbid I mentioned the, the thigh gap, but. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> It's definitely, you know, it changes over time. But at the end, I think we started out here and we're coming back around to it. It's that like these aesthetic goals don't keep you coming. I mean, maybe for a very small percentage of people for a short period of time. Yeah, yeah but that's not the people who need healthy behaviors. Those are people who are self-motivated and we're going to do it whether there was a gym or not, whether there was a coach or not. Right. But that's not who needs coaching, right? I that's mean, <laughs> that's the whole point is we're, we need to do a better job of, of speaking to who we want to help. So I think what you're doing with balanced life, balanced lifestyles, balanced balance health, health styles. styles. <laughs> I keep messing that up because I really want to, like, it's about balanced lifestyles, but balanced health styles um, is, is definitely an interesting place to watch because I think setting the tone and raising the bar of the, the quality of information that's put out is so, so needed right now. And it's, it's a really exciting project. And reducing the, perce the perception that coaches are in competition with each other. Oh, gosh, I yes. would like to have a coherent message and someone can pick the person that resonates with them without feeling like, are they better than this person or more qualified than that person, or, you know, I don't know. It just, I feel like it makes people insecure when there is rampant competition and yeah. everyone's trying to outdo each other. I want to dig into that a little bit more because from, again, from a cultural anthropology perspective, right? When you feel threatened in any way, 
right? What, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to take care of yourself. And so if you have coaches in a position where you, they feel like their financial stability is threatened or they, they can't make a living by sharing with other coaches, that it's going to be really hard to create an environment where people are comfortable doing that. And so I think it's got to come along with the evolution of how we set up our, our coaching practices and how we manage our clients, because it's super hard to get people to collaborate when they don't feel safe. Right. Mm -hmm. So how, how are you addressing that part of it through balanced health styles? Well, like I started out in the beginning, I was like, um, it's hard to do all the marketing things. It's its own whole job. Well, what yeah. if you didn't have to do it all yourself? What if one person could write a blog instead of having to write something every week and then do all the social media yourself and everything? What if you only had to do it once a month or once a quarter because someone else in your collaboration is writing next week's article or next month's article? But it all goes out in a coherent social media feed and then it draws every and everyone shares that social media feed, whether it's your article or your buddy's article that is next week. It solves your social media posting problem because you're always going to have something to post, whether it's yours or someone else's, because it all points back to the website where your other articles are there. You're going to get exposure every week because everyone's pointing back to the same one blog every week. And so it's a coherent message. Anyway. Sorry. Say again. Uh, sorry. I was saying, I think most coaches are all saying the same thing anyway. So it makes sense for them to share in the same platform. Yeah, it does make sense. And everyone's blog, they're like, SEO, optimize your blog so that you'll rank in Google. And so it's like crabs in a pot. Everyone's trying to outrank <laughs> each other. Like there's thousands of health coaches. I think um, the national board certification that has started in the last couple of years, there are si over 6,000 mm. board certified health coaches and more coming up because we're in the first cohort from PN that's going to be able to sit for the board certification. So what, 6,000 coaches are supposed to blog and try to rank on the first page of Google? How's that going to work? This is such an interesting space too, because the problem is, is that because most people, when they do start their, their health or fitness journey, they're coming from the model of marketing that we have that already exists, which is aesthetic, right? So they're not searching for health coach. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants to lose weight, they don't search for health coach, do they? They search for personal trainer. Mm -hmm. So how do we overcome that? Because I think this is, this is one of the fundamental marketing issues that we're facing here is that like we know having come up I mean all of us have been personal trainers right all of us <laughs> then went wait a second I'm not getting the results that I want with my client I need to go figure out how to help them with their nutrition and then you you set out on the nutrition path and you say oh okay well now I know how to help them eat better but they're not doing it and then you realize you need the behavior change psychology and understanding how people actually work component. And now you've evolved as a coach out of just being a personal trainer, but you're still getting most of your marketing or most of your clients are coming in through a personal training outlet. So how do we change the narrative around what people should be looking for when they're trying to improve their health and fitness away from just that aesthetic model? Right. So most people, when they first come upon like their problem, they're not searching, what is my solution? Like, I have high blood pressure. I need a personal trainer. That's too far of a gap. Like, the totally. average person is not going to be able to get from here to there. Their doctor's like, you have high blood pressure. You need to get your stress down, is what they say. So the person comes to Google. We have to think as coaches, for the problems we solve, what is someone typing into Google? Absolutely. And it balanced health styles to take some of that pressure off someone who just wants to coach. We're doing the SEO optimization in the background for them. All you gotta do is write your article. In fact, we have like our magic ways to know what, what are gonna be trending in three to six months as far as searches on Google. And we'll tell you like four months in advance. These are the topics. If you wanna, if this is part of your practice, write an article, we'll publish it at the right time so that those search terms come up when people are going to, when that 
keyword is going to be trending or that topic is going to be trending. So we're doing a lot of optimization so that all of Balance Health Styles articles are coming up to the, you know, higher in Google at the time when people are searching throughout the course of the year, you know, different things are popular during different times of the year. Mm. So how, go ahead, Caitlin. Did you have no, I was just saying that makes sense with the, the you know, like the seasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it does matter. I mean, we're coming through the, the notorious season of health and fitness right now, right? Like <laughs> not to, not to uh, talk about the elephant in the room back there with the, <laughs> the Christmas tree and Caitlin's got her lights up and, you know, lots of people are feeling really frustrated at this time of year. And well, out it's of January where people go crazy, they're like resolutions. I'm going to get my act together. I'm going to hire someone to help me. Right. right now they won't pick up the phone. <laughs> You know, what's really interesting is I, I've never had a December like the one I'm having right now, because typically as coaches, we know that this is, this is when we get time off, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Because people are doing family things, they're traveling, all of this stuff is happening. And I'll, I have to say, I have generated more clients this December um, than any other December in history. And so I think there is a shift happening where people are saying, I don't want to repeat this cycle. I don't want to do the same thing. And it goes back to this pendulum analogy. It's like right now the pendulum is all the way over in one direction towards, you know, festivities and feasting and all of these sort of hedonistic, for lack of a better word, kind of things that we enjoy doing that we deny ourselves later in the year when we're feeling guilty about whatever it is about our health that we're unhappy about. You know, it's, it's realizing that I don't want to repeat that cycle earlier. That's been an interesting trend that I'm seeing this year. So I'm wondering how it's going to play out in January, because we did notice even within the gym industry, um, a decline. We used to every year, it was January 15th. It was not the first of the year because people are trying juice cleanses and detoxes and all sorts of other things, kicking the pendulum all the way over the other direction. And when that doesn't work, that was when they showed up at the gym and said, I I'm looking for a coach. So it was really January 15th, but it was over the last six years in the gym industry, we've seen less and less of that. And it's been a really interesting trend because we had we had positioned ourselves after so many years of that being the case to be ready. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody was on staff. We had special packages. We did all these extra things to try to retain our members and keep people coming. And it had diminishing returns every year over the last six years. So I think it'd be quite interesting to see how people are shifting their mentality around health and fitness. And if this, this deep health approach is actually what more people are looking for. I hope so. Yeah. Right. I would like to shift the conversation in the coaching industry toward that because again, it's that self, it's that self-perpetuating cycle. If what we're talking about is going to seep out into the population and that's going to be the conversation. So let's steer, if we want people to be more aware of deep health, let's talk about it more and just stop talking about the aesthetic, those more shallow values. Yeah, for sure. Because I think it starts at the coaching level, right? Because we, we started out this conversation talking about like the cycle that's perpetuating itself of, you know, I am a personal trainer. I am offering aesthetic goals. Here's my packaging for your aesthetic goals. I can get this done in X amount of time. And if that's what is being offered and that's what people are going to continue to think is the solution. So, I mean, there's, there's definitely some work that needs to be done in the coaching industry to change the narrative, but there's also a lot we could be doing. And this is again, why, you know, we are starting this deep health Academy and you're doing balanced health styles to try to start to change the narrative around what it means to get healthy and fit and to lead a fulfilling life. Because in the end, this is what our clients come to us for, whether they think they want a six pack or not, right? Like they think that six pack is going to make them happy mm -hmm. when they get there. And so, you know, some people it does, but for the vast majority of people, if they do manage to achieve that goal, they still are the same person they were before they had a six pack. And a lot of the issues that they were feeling haven't been resolved. So I, I'm super excited to hear that there are more platforms coming that are going to support coaches who are interested in this. I'm super excited to be starting to put out more content from our source, Deep Health Academy, um, and to have more experts coming on to discuss the same topics and to create that collaborative environment and coaching that's been so missing. Um, this has been a really fun chat. I've had a really nice time discussing this with you guys. Is there anything else you feel like we should talk about before we sign off for today? Or is there something you can say to sort of sum up 
all of what we've been discussing. I know that's everybody loves that one, right? Like I would just like to invite coaches who, if anything that we've talked about has resonated with you, to reach out to Chris, to reach out to me, to reach out to Caitlin and find out how you can get involved. If you want to start collaborating, we're a great resource. You know, we're well connected in the community and you're just able to network with your industry peers. Yeah, absolutely. So check her out. It's at balancedhealthstyles.com. Um, also coming soon will be a whole new umbrella category at deephealthacademy.com. So you'll see more of Caitlin's work there. You'll see more of some of what uh, Coach John and I have been working on as well. So there's a lot coming out in Deep Health and you could just make it through the next two weeks of the holidays. There's going to be a whole new methodology out there for you to be following. So uh, thanks to everybody who tuned in and uh, thanks to Heather for coming on. This is a great chat. Thanks so much. I'm All right. <laughs> Happy Friday, everybody. Happy Friday.